Well, Hammer Museum coming to you live from Los Angeles. I'm Claudia Bester. I'm the director of Hammer Public Programs, and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's Hammer Forum on the recent Supreme, Supreme Court decision on restrictive abortion laws in Louisiana. Before we get started, I have a few notes for the audience. This program is being conducted via Zoom webinar, and in a Zoom webinar, we cannot see you in the audience and we can't hear you. We can just see your names and anything that you type into the chat box and the Q&A box. We'd love for you all to introduce yourselves in the chat box and tell us where you're tuning in from. The chat is also an area where the audience can all talk with each other. And the Q&A box is where you type in questions you have for the panelists. Please note that this program is being recorded and will be available later on the Hammer website. Also, if you'd like to receive reminder emails about upcoming events, please sign up for our email list on the Hammer website. And you can also find recordings of most of our past public programs on the Hammer website as well. So on to today's program. The Hammer Forum is a monthly series of public discussions about current social and political issues, and it's made possible with support from the Rosenblum family. 10 days ago on June 29th, the US Supreme Court struck down a Louisiana abortion law in a five to four decision. So today we'll discuss what the case was about, why the justices voted the way they did, and what this all means for abortion rights in the United States moving forward. We have two guest speakers today. One is an expert on the Supreme Court and one is with reproductive health care provider Planned Parenthood. Dahlia Lithwick is a senior editor at Slate where she covers legal issues and the Supreme Court and writes the columns Supreme Court Dispatches and Jurisprudence. And she's a contributing editor at Newsweek and has been a guest columnist for the New York Times op-ed page. Lithwick also hosts the podcast Amicus. Lithwick graduated with an English degree from Yale University where she was a competitive debater. She went on to graduate with a law degree from Stanford and then clerked for Judge Proctor Hug in the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. In 2018, the Sidney Hillman Foundation awarded her the Hillman Prize for Opinion, Opinion and Analysis Journalism, noting that she has been the nation's best legal commentator for two decades. Jacqueline Ayers is the Vice President of Government Relations and Public Policy at the Planned Parenthood Action Fund, where she's responsible for the strategic direction of le legislative affairs, global advocacy, and federal and state policy and external partnership teams. Ayers began her career as the Associate Director for the ACL ACLU of Indiana, where she worked to develop public education campaigns on racial profiling and the importance of civic participation. She then went on to work for Virginia Congressman Robert C. Scott and has worked since then to advance policy and legislation at the state and federal levels for trade associations, ACLU affiliates, and the National Urban League, and now with Planned Parenthood in Washington, DC. Our moderator tonight is Loyola Law School professor, Jessica Levinson. Levinson studies the law of the political process, including election law and governance issues. Her work focuses on ethics, political corruption, voting rights, campaign finance, ballot initiatives, redistricting, term limits, and state budgets. She regularly appears as a legal and political expert on television and radio and in print. She's the host of the new podcast, Passing Judgment, and has, we has a weekly legal segment on NPR member station KCRW here in Los Angeles. She's also an op-ed contributor for NBC.com. Um, and she's the associate director of Loyola Journalist Law School. Professor Levinson served as the president of the Los Angeles Ethics Commission until 2018. She's also the founding director of Loyola Law School's Public Service Institute, which is dedicated to creating the next generation of leaders in government service. So hello and welcome, Professor Levinson. Hello, and thank you for having me, Claudia. I have so been looking forward to this discussion and it could not be more timely. I'm so thankful to the Hammer for doing the Supreme Court series, for creating a space for us to talk about uh, the biggest decisions coming out of the court. And I've seen in the chat, a few of you have asked about the decision today. We'll talk about that briefly at the end, and then we're actually gonna have a full uh, panel on that uh, July 22nd with uh, Neil Katyal, the former acting solicitor general, and Ariane DeVogue from CNN. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna briefly talk about what we're gonna talk about, which is reproductive rights and the Supreme Court, which has of course so much power over our reproductive rights. And I've always had the feeling that if people associate one thing with the Supreme Court, 
it really is reproductive rights and abortion. If people, the first thing people say when we talk about a new nominee to the Supreme Court typically seems to be what's their position on Roe versus Wade. I want to talk to the panels today about whether Roe versus Wade is really even the law of the land. But let me really briefly uh, lay the landscape out to just show you the many restrictions that are in place currently for women who want to obtain access uh, to an abortion. And so if we could call up the slides for a moment. Um, so that's just the title slide. If we could go to the next slide, these two slides list uh, the many restrictions that are in place in states throughout the nation. So I'll just call out a few of them. 43 states uh, prohibit abortion after a certain time period. 39 states require an abortion to be formed by a licensed physician. 21 states have laws that prohibit late term abortions. There's different definitions of what late term is. Uh, 12 states restrict uh, coverage of abortion in private insurance plans. Could we call up the next slide for a moment, please? I know I'm going quickly. These slides will be on the Hammer website. And the source is the Guttmacher Institute um, with a link there that you can get a lot more information. Um, so what else do we have? 45 states allow individual healthcare providers to refuse to participate in an abortion. Uh, 18 states require some form of counseling before obtaining an abortion. Uh, 26 states have some sort of waiting period, and 37 states have uh, some level of uh, parental notification requirement when it comes to minors obtaining an abortion. So if we could take down the slides and bring in our guests, I am extremely excited to see, we did uh, just do a sound check, but I'm extremely excited to see them again on my screen. Um, Dolly Lewithlick and Jacqueline Ayers, I'm really just uh, very thrilled that you're with us. And so, as I said in the beginning, um, one of the things I think that people most associate the Supreme Court with is abortion and access to reproductive rights. And there was just a big decision that came out of the court. Um, you know what, my timing during COVID is off, but let's go ahead and say within the last week, and this was the first big abortion restriction um, that happened with our new court. So famously, uh, Justice Anthony Kennedy was the swing vote on the court. And he was really, in my mind, a conservative who in some instances voted with liberal jurists. And one of those instances was abortion rights. And this is the first abortion case that we had uh, dealing with the new court, where we had Justice Anthony Kennedy replaced by one of his former clerks, Justice Brett Kavanaugh, where we had Justice Scalia replaced by Justice Neil Gorsuch. And so I want to talk about the new court and what that means for reproductive rights. So um, we're going to mainly start with Dahlia to walk us through the cases, and then we're going to um, bring in Jacqueline a little bit more uh, heavily towards the end to give us the lay of the land of what's really happening in the states now, where is the fight, and, um, and what resources do we have? So, Dahlia, with that, the case that the court just decided, this Louisiana case, might feel like deja vu all over again. Can you explain to us why this particular law, well, what the law is and why it may feel familiar? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you uh, to Jessica, to Claudia, uh, to, to all of you who are tuning in. Um, when we were planning this, we didn't quite know that it was going to be the last day of the term and that there was going to be stuff detonating all around. So it's really a treat to be with you. Um, yeah, it's deja vu uh, because it is literally the identical law. Uh, four years ago in 2016, at least half of this case, uh, there were two parts that the court uh, reviewed when this case came up from Texas. Uh, one of those two parts was this admitting privileges law that we saw in Louisiana. So the reason it feels so familiar is 
almost word for word, stroke of the pen by stroke of the pen, this was litigated in 2016. Uh, in 2016, the court heard what the case was Whole Women's Health. It was two uh, regulations on abortion in Texas. One of them was the requirement that every um, clinic would have to reverse engineer itself to turn itself into what was known as an ambulatory surgical center. Uh, you had to basically put HVACs in and widen the hallways so you could have stretchers, do all sorts of things uh, that would have had the effect of shuttering most of the clinics in Texas. The other provision, which is the one that Louisiana carries over into this lit litigation, is that doctors had to have uh, admitting privileges at a local hospital within 30 miles of where they were um, performing abortions. And the consequence is that that admitting privileges law, because it's quite literally identical to the one in the Texas case, uh, this was the same case. And as you said, then the kind of big doctrinal question is, what does subbing out Anthony Kennedy for Brett Kavanaugh and Neil Gorsuch do to the law, not how is the law different? Yeah, yeah. so now that um, you told us essentially that we weren't crazy, that it looks like carbon copy laws. Um, Jacqueline, I do wanna bring you in for a moment. Can you remind us, are these laws common? Is this something that typically just happens in uh, Texas and Louisiana? Um, do a lot of women face these types of restrictions? Yeah, thank you so much. And I also wanna extend my thanks, uh, Claudia and Jessica to the Ham Reformer and Dahlia, it's good to be here with you. Um, I uh, The case was last week, uh, Jessica, it's hard to remember the weeks are going uh, by very quickly. What are days anymore, right? But um, it, it was just last week that, you know, I think for uh, the people in Louisiana, what it means is that they were allowed to have a sigh of relief. Unfortunately, access to abortion in this country continues to really hang on by a thread. Um, too often it depends on your zip code and where you are in this country. And thank you for um, sharing the slides and data from the Guttmacher Institute. Um, it's actually over, since 2011, 460 restrictions have passed. So um, it's important to remember that while we got a win in the June medical case, uh, it is just for a moment because there are uh, an additional 15 cases that are just steps away from the Supreme Court. Um, we continue to see states, even in the midst of pandemic this year in 2020, we've seen state governors put in barriers, additional barriers to getting care by deeming abortion as not an essential uh, healthcare service. So depending on where you are and what state you have these uh, what are commonly referred to as trap laws, targeted regulations against abortion providers. These laws are really making it so that um, abortion uh, unfortunately continues to depend on where you are and uh, having the right is not enough if you don't have access. Yeah, thank you. And um, it's, it's good to remember that these aren't just academic issues, obviously, that these are issues that affect uh, real people every day. And we saw this, as you mentioned, um, you know, during the beginning of COVID when uh, we were all shutting down and there was this push to say uh, abortions are not um, medically necessary. And this is one of the things that we're going to try and, and limit. And I, it looks like based on the Q&A that we might talk about that a little bit more at the end. So now um, I want to go back to Dahlia and talk about these two cases a little bit more. So we have a Texas case that's a re restriction which says physicians that perform abortions, you have to have admitting privileges. We have a Louisiana law that says physicians who, uh, who perform abortions, you have to have admitting privileges. We have a decision from 2016 in Whole Women's Health where a bare majority of the court led by Justice Kennedy says, these laws present an undue burden. It seems like we, if the laws are as identical as you say, which I agree they are, why did the court take this Louisiana case in the first place? Well, that, that was the question. And I think, you know, there's a short answer, which is that the Fifth Circuit had said, right, this court, this case, uh, extensive finding of facts in the district court in Louisiana. And the judge said, look, this is, you know, every one of these doctors in good faith tried to get admitting privileges at local hospitals. There's a whole host of reasons Jacqueline can tell you better than I 
why physicians can't get admitting privileges, the chief among them is that abortion is incredibly safe and very, very few women are rushed to the ER following an abortion. So it's not in any hospital's interest to give doctors admitting privileges when they don't send patients to the hospitals. Layered over that, there's a huge problem of religiously affiliated hospitals that don't want to, that actually overtly say, we will not admit, admit uh, offer admitting privileges to somebody who performs abortion. So there's a whole bunch of reasons that physicians can't get them. Uh, the doctors in this case largely made good faith efforts. The district court said they tried uh, and and the Fifth Circuit was really the, the sticky wicket here because we had the Court of Appeals, uh, uh, famously a very, very conservative one, that's essentially, Jessica, faced with the question you just asked, how is this different from Whole Women's Health just decided? The best they could come up with was because Louisiana is different than Texas. Uh, so somehow that, uh, you know, they did a little back of the envelope calculus. They said, oh, this is going to shutter a different number of clinics. And doctor number three didn't really try hard enough. And I think they just tried to kind of pull a fast one and say, we're just going to over go ahead and overrule whole women's health here at the Fifth Circuit. And, you know, Hail Mary, the justices are different. Maybe we'll get a different outcome. So I think the short answer is the court had to reverse it unless they wanted to be overturned from below. I think the doctrinal word for that is chutzpah, right? The court was not going to let uh, an appeals court overrule a brand new decision. The better question in some sense is why they didn't just summarily say, right. this is ridiculous. You know, don't pee on my leg and say it's raining. Uh, this is the exact same case. Go away and don't overturn the Supreme Court. And the reason I think that people like Jacqueline and I got very nervous when they granted it is that it looked like now maybe there were five votes to go ahead and, and do the thing uh, that they had been asked to do by Louisiana, which is go ahead and reverse. So it was a, a pretty hairy grant because they could have just done this with a stroke of a pen. I just want to point out, we got sticky wicket, don't pee on my leg, chutzpah, and Harry Grant all in <laughs> one answer. We, this is the, the promise of the hammer form to unpack really important legal issues in an accessible way. Um, I'm not going to ask if that's water in your cup yet. <laughs> so I, that, that was the sticking point for me also, which is why not just say to the Fifth Circuit, we decided this case, thanks so much for your time. But instead, of course, the court did ask for and did hear um, a full briefing. And we know what happened. We know that, uh, that the court changed in terms of the composition of the court. And we know what the outcome was in this, again, the recent Louisiana case, um, where it was another five to four decision. But in this case, um, we have Chief Justice John Roberts voting with the liberals. And, you know, the day after it felt like never was anyone uh, so hated since Aaron Burr, uh, when Chief Justice Roberts says, all right, liberals, I'll join with you, but writes a separate opinion. Can you tell us, it, well, let's start actually with if the laws were so identical, if the case had already been applied, excuse me, if the case had already been decided, what were the four dissenters saying here? Well, I think there's one piece of the case that didn't get enough attention. And again, I'm gonna defer to Jacqueline if she wants to amplify, but one thing that the court adds in, in this go round is what looks like a hyper-technical question about who has standing yeah. to sue. So let's do that for one second, because I do think Somehow it didn't get in the headlines, but I think it's a real harbinger of what's to come. So suddenly it has always been the case that um, a doctor could have what's called third party standing, that a physician, an abortion provider, a clinic could sue on behalf of a woman seeking to terminate a pregnancy. That was not a controversial position. That's been the case. Uh, uh, for decades, suddenly out of the blue, that comes winging into the case where one of the questions that the court suddenly is looking at is whether they can do away with this so-called third party standing altogether. It would have had the effect had the court ruled on this issue of making it virtually impossible 
for a woman to sue to enforce her own reproductive rights, right? You're asking somebody who is often poor, often, you know, in an incredibly fragile state, who's time bound, right? Because at some point uh, she's no longer pregnant. All of those reasons allowed physicians to sue on behalf of, of their patients. And one of the things that was an issue at in this case that was new that we didn't see in Whole Women's Health was this idea that maybe doctors uh, can't sue on behalf of their patients. In fact, Justice Alito writing in his dissent is like they're actually in an adversarial position. Doctors have a financial interest to deceive the women that they represent and they shouldn't be allowed to have standing. And I only flag it because it didn't get a ton of attention. There were not five votes, but I do think that that is an issue that's bubbling up to try to peer Peel away doctors and women and say their interests are not aligned. And that in future, should that resurface, is going to really be a perilous, perilous place for women to be who want to effectuate their rights. So that's a huge coda, but I think it's important. Um, I guess what I would just say is the other thing that changed after Justice Kavanaugh came on the court is that a whole raft of other states started passing laws that weren't just the trap laws that Jacqueline described. Suddenly we were seeing states all over the country, right? We can remember Ohio, Georgia, passing laws that are overtly criminalizing, overtly going after women and their physicians and saying in Texas, there were hearings about actually having capital punishment for women who sought to terminate their pregnancy. So this whole, and we will talk about Casey in a minute, but this whole kind of fiction that, oh, we don't want to criminalize or punish, we, we love women, we want them to make better choices, has really been stripped away. And, and this is a brand new thing that's happened in the last year and a half. And suddenly the whole line of cases that say, if we just make you know, hospitals more comfortable, if we just give women more information, if we tell them that there is a connection between suicide and, and uh, abortion, not true, if we have mandatory ultrasound laws, they'll make better choices. All of that kind of collapsed under the weight, quite literally, of the Kavanaugh confirmation, where suddenly a lot of states were just very emboldened to say, we're not wasting time shuttering clinics anymore. We're just going to put women and their doctors in jail. So that is a different thing. And I think it's another thing that's coming that is really profoundly different from the trap laws. Okay, so the very, very short answer, which is now bookmarked by my two weird interpolations is that I think that the, the dissenters in this case either wanted to just straight up say, no, <laughs> we, whole women's health was wrong. And uh, you know this case either needs to go back to the lower courts under this different standard, you know, the doctors uh, should just try a little harder if they can't get their admitting privileges and all the clinics close. This is essentially Brett Kavanaugh. Well, then we should really reassess. And then I think that there are some of them who are really pretty punitive. Justice Alito and Justice Gorsuch were talking about, you know, rat infested clinics and Kermit Gosnell again. So I think that the dissenters really, I don't think, hide or make any bones about the fact that they want clinics shut down. Yeah. Um, and Jacqueline, I do want to pick up with you um, kind of on the flip side of um, June Medical, I, this issue of standing that Dahlia flagged, and it sounds like, oh, it's just a procedural doctrine, and, you know, is that a huge deal? But as Dahlia pointed out, um, it's, it's an enormous deal. It did feel like a flag for us for what could happen in the future, and, um, and it, it's not something that we commonly talk about, but we should in terms of who has the ability to vindicate these rights. And of course, there's a long history dating back to Harry Blackman, who wrote the uh, Roe decision, being affiliated with the Mayo Clinic, who famously wrote Roe, in my reading, in large part to protect the rights of physicians. And women were there as part of the story, but maybe not the key players, which is another theme I want to pick up um, with you, Dolly, in a minute. And then, um, and so, uh, God, there, we could do 15 different panels on each one of those portions. But to get back to the case, we know now um, what the dissent said. Now, what about Chief Justice John Roberts, now the most powerful jurist in the world, 
Um, he didn't join the majority. So why didn't he join and, and what did he say? Yeah, I, I can jump in and Dahlia would love for you to add here too. I, I do want to um, just <laughs> jokingly share with the audience that uh, we tried, it didn't work to do a little hashtag third party standing to see if we could get that uh, to trend uh, just jokingly. But really actually why we saw that new procedural argument pursue, uh, pushing is because look, they understand after this many years, only three organizations primarily litigate in this space. It's the American Civil Liberties Union, Center for Reproductive Rights, who brought this June medical case and Planned Parenthood. And so our ability to sue on behalf of our patients has been unquestioned. It's always, as Dahlia mentioned, been the uh, law of the land. If you look at what is in the pipeline, it's really important to remember that because there are 15 cases in the pipeline, they knew that by pursuing a new uh, argument around a procedural issue, they would be able to dismantle all of those cases all at one time. Um, so this was very intentional. It seems like a small thing, but it is about, um, and, and for Planned Parenthood, frankly, we have nearly uh, 30 cases in the pipeline in the federal courts um, trying to push back on this state restriction. So um, it is uh, really a new a thing that is emerging and then I think the other thing um, we saw is particularly since Kavanaugh state legislators who came in and pushing these uh, unconstitutional bans, most of the time who uh, were bans that are at the point before people even know that they are uh, pregnant. Um, and we saw these uh, really uh, egregious laws being pushed forward. What I think Roberts was sort of signaling to states in uh, his concurrence is his repeated agreement with the uh, with um, the Texas law, he references back to um, the uh, whole women's health law, the law that was at stake in Texas, and mentioning that he believed it was wrongly decided before, right? And I think he is signaling there to the states, to state legislators and pos uh, politicians who are hostile to reproductive health care, um, that hey, it would be okay if you don't send me your six week abortion ban, but if you were to send me something that kind of looks like this, I, I am uh, open to uh, this time siding with, um, siding with the conservatives on the court. So actually um, what everybody sort of was uh, trying to applaud John Roberts uh, last week um, and indicating that he had done a good thing here, that he gave us a win. Um, we really did pay attention much more to that concurrence because it is uh, signaling to state legislators that there is there are restrictions and barriers that he would approve. Jacqueline, thank you for jumping in. I, I apologize that I didn't um, I was looking at you when I asked the question, but of course that's impossible to discern over Zoom. And um, I wanted, I was gonna get to this later, but um, let's all discuss it now for a moment, which is, um, you, you know, so let's just remind everybody where we are. We had the Texas case from 2016. We have the Louisiana case where the restriction is essentially a mirror. And we have a different Supreme Court we have in this case, Chief Justice John Roberts joining the liberal majority of the court and essentially saying, I'm still OK if I mean, one of you can correct me or both of you. I'm still OK with these restrictions, but I can't vote the way I want to because we just decided this case. And so if you just hadn't been so quite so egregious about it, I could have voted as a true conservative jurist. Uh, but you left me basically no choice on this. And, um, and he did a couple of things in the concurrence that I thought, um, well, that for the pro-choice community might give you, as Jacqueline just said, some pause. Um, one is uh, to use another legal term, kind of futzing with the legal standard. And, um, and so maybe, Maybe we should actually start with that, but I did want to flag, Dolly, you had a great episode on Amicus, your podcast, where you talked about the fact that people's reaction to John Roberts' concurrence really tends to fall on gender lines. And so I also looked at that concurrence and I thought, oh, this is temporarily decent news and long-term it's um, potentially not if you're pro-choice. And so, Maybe, um, Dahlia, back to you and then to Jacqueline. What was the futzing? So what is the current legal standard when it comes to abortion rights and access to abortion? <clears throat> is it Roe versus Wade? 
or um, is it a different case? And how did John Roberts try and change that? I love the segue, the subtle segue from chutzpah to futzing. It's like a 95 year old, like Jewish man in a bagel store is like writing this entire doctrine. Uh, it, it's, I think it's gonna require just a tiny history and I'll do it um, as fast as I can. But I think folks know that Roe v. Wade, it, Wade was decided in 1973 and the court created um, this three part, you know, this three trimester standard that was just, you know, at the time made perfect sense to uh, Justice Blackman, but was very quickly outmoded just about how uh, the state interest in regulating abortion sort of declines over the, the pregnancy. And that was the standard. And then famously in 1992, uh, folks will recall, there was huge questions about, and this goes back to Jessica's introduction, you know, every, at that point, every single confirmation hearing was like, oh my God, is this person going to overturn Roe? And that was the question about Sandra Day O'Connor. That was the question about Anthony Kennedy. That was Justice David Souter. The three of them in Planned Parenthood Casey actually come together and come up with this different standard. So they say, look, we're going to preserve the core holding of Roe. We're going to dismantle this crazy trimester standard. It makes no sense. It's medically um, archaic. We're going to do this funky new thing called the undue burden standard. And what that means is that the state can regulate abortion, but it cannot create an undue burden on a woman's right uh, to to end her pregnancy and then goes on to sort of describe that as a substantial obstacle. And if people are just saying, what does that mean? That was the question. It meant something magical in Sandra Day O'Connor's head, but nobody ever fully knew what this undue burden standard was. And it really flung open the door to the kinds of regulations that Jacqueline is describing. What it did was it gutted the idea that uh, Roe v. Wade stood for that there is this constitutional right for abortion. And it said, as long as you're just giving warnings, as long as you're just, you know, uh, helping women make better decisions, as long as you're doing all these things and you're not creating an undue burden, then the laws can go forward. And it's worth remembering that we think of Casey as a big sort of reification of the core principles of Roe, there was actually only one law that was struck down uh, in Casey under that new standard. It was a spousal notification. Justice O'Connor, there was no way she was going to say women had to tell, say, an abusive spouse uh, that she was terminating, but everything else survived. And then we had just decades of the kinds of laws that said, you know, oh, this is just uh, you know, really, uh, doctors giving information. This is just a mandatory ultrasound. Uh, this is just changing clinics. This is just a 72 hour waiting period. Uh, whatever it was, it was all okay. And uh, Justice Kennedy really famously in the so-called partial birth abortion case, just jumped in with both feet and said, you know, poor little women, they make bad decisions. It's okay uh, if the court substitutes judgment. And that really brings us to this case where it's clear that uh, undue burden is always going to be something inchoate and fuzzy. And in Whole Women's Health, Justice Breyer said, you know what, I'm going to change the standard slightly. I'm going to put some teeth in it. And I'm going to say, if these laws are utterly pretextual, if they don't help women at all, and in this case, he combed the nation to find places where admitting privileges uh, saved women's lives or ambulatory surgical units saved. He's like, no evidence. To do that, he said, the courts are going to pierce that pretext. If the only purpose of these laws are to shutter clinics, the courts have a duty to look at the benefits to women. And he creates this kind of balancing test. And he says, if you're going to say undue burden, also look at whether there's any benefit to women at all. That was a test he created in Whole Women's Health. So the big move, in addition to the one you just described, Jessica, of saying, okay, I agree that this is clearly precedent. This is the identical case, stare decisis. I can't bring myself to overrule a four-year-old precedent. The other big move is that he has just quite literally said, I'm pulling out that benefits prong. Where it, he, he sort of makes fun of the language of it. 
He cracks up, you know, at how funny, like the ha 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 Justice Kennedy language is. And then he says, nobody, nobody has to look at that anymore. We're just looking at undue burden again. So he reinstates effectively the Casey rule. Yeah, Jacqueline, um, back to you on this issue of standards. We go from Roe to Casey to a weak Casey to a strong Casey to who knows what's going to happen. And again, you know, when I think about this test, undue burden, it's kind of what I try and talk to my students about, which is it's whatever you want it to be at the time, right? It's just like rational basis. It's just like legitimate governmental interest, compelling governmental interest. It's whatever the court thinks it means at the time. So um, kind of in an artfully stated question for you, was that also, or I should say, what was your takeaway from the Roberts opinion and where, um, where do you go? Uh, what does that allow, how does that change your work? Um, reading that opinion? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think um, if you uh, talk to the litigators at uh, Planned Parenthood who have been closely watching this case and working along the Center for Reproductive Rights, um, what everyone said is this case uh, was a sigh of relief for today. Um, we really cannot take it to mean much more than keeping the status quo, which obviously right now, as we talked about, is the status quo for women's access to abortion, um, really depends on where you are. And unfortunately for uh, black and brown women in this country, disproportionately uh, access is almost inaccessible, it's completely inaccessible depending on where you are. And um, what uh, the where this really leaves us and how our litigators are thinking about this and, and Robert's ability to signal to states to send him something in which he would um, uh, apply this new legal precedent, it's really Really an open question. Um, so we should not at all take June Medical to mean that we have uh, uh, reaffirmed uh, the right to roll. We have reaffirmed Casey. This is not even really a reaffirmation of whole women's health. And because there were um, many dissenting opinions, concurrence, there actually is not five votes for one opinion in this case, right? It is um, everyone writing differently. And what Roberts is saying is that he would apply this sort of undue burden standard to a new and different types of law. And we've already seen that states are not waiting. Um, in just uh, the last uh, few weeks, we've seen Mississippi, Tennessee, um, and Louisiana all move either state bills or ballot initiatives um, in an effort to try to bring that next new thing, that open question um, is gonna continue to be something that uh, the opposition to reproductive health care tries and pushes through. And I think um, you know we really uh, won't know until one of these next cases uh, is, is ready. And, and you know, folks should remember that it could be as soon as next term um, that you know we could have another abortion-related case uh, uh, that is before the court. But certainly within the next three to five years, um, the what Roe means and the right uh, to your access to abortion continues to be um, completely under attack and not a settled question of law. Jacqueline, can I stay with you for a second? We didn't plan that much uh, to talk about this, but you talked about. Um, a, f a few things, one of which is, you know, the term as a whole and access to reproductive care. And uh, this week we saw another decision in the Little Sisters case dealing with um, reproductive care and access to contraception specifically. So if you could um, remind us, so I just want to flag for the audience, you know, we talked about the Texas case, we talked about the Louis Louisiana case, I want to talk about another case now that the Supreme Court just decided, again, dealing with access to contraception. Could you tell us what the Affordable Care Act originally said, then how it changed a little bit under the Obama administration and how it just changed a little bit more? Yeah, it's um, really important to remember that um, the contraceptive coverage um, and, um, provision of the Affordable Care Act um, has been a real success story. There's 62 million women who've been able to get access to no-cost contraception because of that provision. Um, so it, it really has meant a lot. But ever since it was passed in 2010, opposition has increasingly tried um, to uh, dismantle and bring and, and make sure that not 
uh, all employers would have to comply. Um, so we saw um, uh, really starting in, in uh, 2010 and 2011 under the Obama administration, a, a, a process of promulgating regulations and rules that would have allowed for uh, accommodation and exemptions for religiously affiliated employers, um, specifically uh, universities and uh, uh, churches um, were uh, specifically noted in that first rule that they would not have to um, immediately uh, provide that contraceptive coverage as a part of a health plan. I do wanna um, note one thing that we continue to see in the media is that uh, there's this ongoing conversation about why, why would anybody give free healthcare coverage, free birth control? Um, these are individuals who have a job and as a part of their employee package and benefit, they get health care coverage. And that includes birth control, except you had this group of employers who uh, objected to that. Um, and that included um, uh, for-profit companies uh, like Hobby Lobby and many others. Uh, and so we saw uh, that was the first case uh, where we saw the contraceptive coverage uh, decision be challenged. Um, and we, and unfortunately we saw a rollback there and allowing for-profit companies being able to say to their employees, no, I don't have to cover your birth control coverage. Um, fast forward through many, many iterations of uh, cases in many states and uh, Pennsylvania, um, Trump be Pennsylvania and, and many other religiously affiliated nonprofits continuing in the lower courts to challenge um, that mandate. They've been pushing all along. And then we obviously uh, had an election and we had a change in uh, the administration um, that uh, sought to uh, even further erode back, erode the rules and make it so that less uh, employers would have to comply. And in fact, even expand that exemption and say, not just religiously um, affiliated, but if you have a moral objection, to being able to cover your employees' birth control, you also can opt out. Um, so, uh, you know, I, from our standpoint, yesterday's decision and what folks should know in Trump v. Pennsylvania, um, they allowed that lower court decision at the third court, at the um, third uh, circuit to stand that would say, yes, if you are a religiously affiliated or, um, or uh, employer, universities, hospitals, um, others who may object to providing that birth control coverage, you can do so. And you don't have to um, continue that uh, coverage and earned benefit that that, that employee would get. So I think yesterday's decision was really egregious. It's unfortunate because it does stand for uh, the fact that we're going to see more people lose access to care. Uh, and we know that also, and we saw this in um, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's dissent, um, that uh, we're really creating more of a slippery slope of allowing uh, the use of religion to discriminate against someone's access to their health care. So, you know, I think that um, what it also means is that we do live to fight another day. This case is going to go back down to the lower courts. Um, this is not done yet. So we're going to continue to, you know, push uh, there in the lower courts. And I do have to note um, all of the hard work of uh, groups like the National Women's Law Center who have been uh, key litigators in, in this case and have uh, really brought attention to this issue. But when um, when Planned Parenthood talks to young people, particularly about this issue, um, this is the kind of thing where people can't believe that in 2020, we're still talking about whether or not my employer should make the decision or if I should make the decision about my health care. Um, and so I do think that this is going to continue to be an issue that uh, is really motivating to people. Um, even if they're not watching the courts, they're going to continue to watch this issue. Yeah. And, um, and of course, that's in part tied to the fact that in America, our health insurance is tied to our employment. And it's also tied to what I see as a much bigger theme that the Supreme Court is going to have to tackle. And in fact, uh, you know, tackled in the uh, Montana case that um, we'll talk about in a different hammer form. And this issue of my religious rights versus, and then fill in the blank, my right to be free from discrimination or my right to have access to reproductive care. Um, and that to me feels like one of these looming battles. And so um, I saw in the Q and A, Eric, thank you. You teed up um, the question about Little Village, uh, Little Village, Little Sisters for us. And um, I want to now, um, Jacqueline, don't go away. I want to go back to, Dahlia for a minute and talk kind of globally about, we see what happened in the Louisiana decision who, and we saw who wrote the majority, uh, who wrote the concurrence, who wrote the dissent. We see what happened in the Little Sisters case dealing with again, the Affordable Care Act and the exemption 
uh, that's in place for employers who say, I have a sincerely held uh, religious or moral objection. Um, and you had a great discussion in one of your pieces in Slate, I think it was yesterday or today. And you basically said, where are the ladies? Um, and he said, women are being written out of abortion jurisprudence. Can you, can you tell us what you meant? Because in fairness, there are four women, or excuse me, there are three women on the Supreme Court. And, um, and certainly they took part in these decisions. So what did you mean by where are the ladies? Well, it, it, it's, I've been thinking about allyship for a long time. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, you know, let's stop and say she's 87. Uh, we probably should have started with that. Um, whenever she talks about the arc of her career, she begins and ends with male allies. It's incredibly important to her, formative to her, to say that you don't have to be a woman to be a feminist and you don't have to be a woman to write poignantly and eloquently about women's rights. And she always tells the story, it's adorable, of when toward the very, very end of his career, then Chief Justice Rehnquist wrote this unbelievably poetic uh, uh, opinion in the Family Medical Leave Act case, surprised the entire world by having this just deep solicitude for what it would be to be a single mom, you know, trying to take care of children and do your job. It was extraordinary. And she always tells the story about how when her husband uh, read the draft opinion, he was like hollered down, you know, the, the corridor, like, did you write this for him, Ruthie? You know, like, because it just was like tripped off his tongue and it was clear, right? That it was contagious the way she thought about it. And truly in truth, you know, Rehnquist did learn a lot. His, his daughter was taking care of children. He learned a lot from, from, life and from experience. And she always tells the story of how important it is to have male allies. So, you know, fast forward to Whole Women's Health. It was written by Justice Breyer. Um, it was a very, very technocratic, you know, if you know Justice Breyer, you know, they're like, there's technocratic and then there's technocratic plus, plus, plus. That's Stephen Breyer. That's his happy place. So he wrote this incredibly, almost cold, dispassionate opinion about why Texas couldn't go ahead and close all those clinics. And Ginsburg could have written a huge concurrence. She wrote a very brief concurrence. It's important to her that men step into this space. And then we get to um, uh, this week's, last week's opinion in June Medical and Breyer has written and the Chief Justice has written, as you said, this very narrow concurrence. It becomes uh, the holding in the case, which is just as Jacqueline said, don't, don't, don't do this exact thing, right? That's all it stands for. And then you have every single man on the court in dissent, right? Every man has written in this case. And there are three women on the court who have not written a word. They silently join in Justice Breyer's opinion. And I think the only thing I would add to that is that there are no women in Justice Breyer's opinion. There are a lot of doctors trying to get admitting privileges. There are a lot of you know, very, very, again, technical balancing tests. He's working it through, but the, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who wrote, you know, when Walmart employees brought a sex discrimination case, the Ruth Bader Ginsburg who dissented in Hobby Lobby, the Ruth Bader Ginsburg who said, when you strip search a teenage girl without her consent in school, this is what it's like to the eight men on the court. The, she has sort of desperately painted the picture of women's lives. That has been her mantle. And that's gone in this case. And so it's not just that no women wrote. It's just almost viscerally shocking that women's lives are not represented, that what Jacqueline started with, you know, women of color, poor women, women in states that are gonna have to drive 150 miles and get a babysitter and get on a bus and, you know, all of that is gone. And so I think it's just, maybe just to dovetail with the question you asked, when there was this deeply gendered reaction to to the Roberts opinion where women were going, you know, Linda Greenhouse wrote and Leah Littman wrote and Melissa Murray wrote and I wrote like, this is a disaster. And a lot of really good progressive men, Larry Tribe, Jeff Tubin, uh, were like, this is a huge win, take the win. 
And I think it's, there is something about being sort of slowly written out of the, of the case. And it, it is exactly what Justice Ginsburg noted this week in The Little Sisters, that there are tens of thousands of women who are going to lose uh, access to affordable contraception in a pandemic. You know? And they are women who are poor and who need it most. And they're not in the opinion. Yeah. Um, it, I mean, it, it is fascinating to see how um, it's like a Rorschach test, how we perceive the opinion. And Jacqueline, um, I, I want to stay with you now for a while. I had about, as you both know, um, three more hours worth of questions on the cases, but sadly, uh, I see the time is 5.55. So I do want to pick up on um, something Dahlia said, which is um, the restrictions that women face. And of course, abortion is a federal issue in the sense that it is um, protected under the Constitution. But as you said so correctly, it matters so much where you live and who you are. And so can we kind of pull back for a minute and can you talk to us about, um, we've been spending a lot of time talking about these uh, admitting privileges. And I introduced this a little bit, but what are some of the most common restrictions that we see on abortion access throughout the country? Um, thank you so much for that question, Jessica. And I think um, it is really important that we take the context of this moment that we find ourselves in in this country in the middle of a pandemic to remember that women are the majority of frontline workers. Women are the majority of hospital workers. They're the majority of childcare workers. Black and brown women are essentially continuing to keep the economy going at a time when in the midst of all of this, politicians are playing uh, with their health care by passing a draconian restrictions on abortion access. And at the same time, your employer could be taking away your birth control coverage. Um, so the, it is really important to remember as um, Dahlia just laid out who we are talking about, right? Women and the individuals who need abortion are people who are religious, who are already mothers, who are primarily living um, at the uh, edge of the poverty line. And um, they are people we know. Um, we know that our friends at the National Network of Abortion Funds reminds us that we all love somebody who has had an abortion. And so um, this idea that we would uh, try to take away bodily autonomy, um, particularly for the most vulnerable, for people who need it, um, it, it really uh, it has to continue to be called out. And I just want to note, um, I read very briefly reference Tennessee. Um, Tennessee, um, in the middle of a pandemic, actually uh, passed a one of the most restrictive abortion um, bans, um, banning abortion uh, very early in pregnancy, um, requiring uh, uh, requiring um, that doctors would have to face criminal penalties, um, and they did this uh, in the middle of the night, keeping protesters, keeping um, uh, advocates outside of the uh, state house so they could do it under the cover of night, and pushing these sorts of unpopular restrictions, and they're doing it that way because these are not popular. They do not have the support of the majority of uh, voters. We know that when we look around at um, uh, just other states that are doing um, similar things, uh, we've uh, talked a little bit about the restrictions on admitting privileges, but there's also equally um, this uh, continued attack on going after um, providers uh, license licensure. So using the state, we saw that this year, a big fight in the state of Missouri, um, preventing a health clinic from getting its license to perform abortion, um, using a state health department uh, to come in and uh, say that a health center was not in compliance with record keeping, right? We see these kinds of ways to use the tools of government to put and stop um, access to abortion. And Louisiana Right now, there is a constitutional amendment that will be on the ballot uh, in this November that uh, would say, despite that federal law, despite what is in the US Constitution for the state of Louisiana, abortion would be completely outlawed. Um, and, and individual getting an abortion would face criminal penalties. Um, so that's on the that's on the ballot in, in a place like Louisiana now, and there's many uh, organizations led by women of color, like the women uh, with a vision in state of Louisiana that are working to push back on these kinds of attacks, but they are really popping up everywhere. Um, and we see each state legislative session 
key trends where they're um, an effort to try to push those kinds of bills um, because they know that if they continue to find ones that can work their way through the lower courts, that's how you get the next uh, test before the Supreme Court. And I just want to close by saying that I think it's important to remind ourselves there have been over 200 conservative judges who have also been added to the lower courts uh, during this administration. And so their ability to get these uh, egregious laws through is easier and easier, putting um, more and more potential for cases to come up to the high court. Um, yeah, and which is such an important reminder, thank you, which is the vast majority of cases are not decided by the Supreme Court. The vast, vast majority of cases are decided by district court judge, judges in, in the Court of Appeals. And um, if I might, you know, how has the new shape of the judiciary, Jacqueline, changed your work? How does it change what you do on a daily basis? Um, yeah, one of the things that we really are driving more attention to is just how much courts matter. And um, just as you said, it's little information is known about how, in fact, the lower courts impact our voting rights, our educational rights, the um, civil rights, our health care rights and access to abortion. So um, we have increasingly uh, been working to educate our supporters about the nominees who are being rushed through the U.S. Senate um, more than any other administration at this point in their administration. Um, and by educating folks about the activist backgrounds of many of these nominees, many who are not necessarily ABA approved, um, many who have uh, been very active in conservative um, circles, who come to the judiciary with a viewpoint, a very clear viewpoint, and not being able um, to show that they can be uh, non-biased uh, toward a particular legal issue. Um, when we see these nominees, we try to educate our supporters, um, making sure that they understand um, these are the folks who who are maybe not known because they're not the nine uh, people on the Supreme Court, but they're gonna impact uh, your laws in the state where you live and uh, really making sure that people understand there's a relationship between who sits on the federal court um, and who is in the White House. Yeah, thank you. And I certainly um, don't feel like you're closing. We have lots of other <laughs> questions. Um, and, and in fact, uh, I need to be a little more generous because it's 6.01 and I see that there are 11 uh, questions pending. So let me go ahead and open up um, the Q&A. We've already gotten to some of these, um, but uh, let's, oh, and I thank you. Thank you, Hammer Forum. I see the slide, uh, Q&As. So yes, please um, put them in the q and I'm not really uh, womaning the chat as much as I uh, could. So um, the qu a question from Paul is, um, isn't it true that Roe versus Wade uh, strictly prohibits abortion during the third trimester except to save the life of the mother? So we kind of talked about Roe versus Wade and how it's not the standard anymore, but um, do one of you kind of want to answer, um, you know, do we have a, do we have a framework anymore or is it just this squishy undue burden? Maybe um, Dolly, you talked about the magical thinking of the undue burden. Do you wanna answer that one? No, I mean, I think that's the answer that the undue burden really did replace the, the trimester um, formula. And, you know, I think there was always um, maybe a little bit of an understanding that you know, the health of the mother, the mental health of the mother. I mean, I think there were always certain uh, implicit uh, understandings of when, even under the most draconian circumstances, you could still, um, uh, you know, waive whatever the law was. And, and I think Jacqueline will describe it better on the ground, but that too has been eroded. I mean, I think that there was at least a tacit understanding that in cases of rape and incest, right, that was the, the always the longstanding uh, exception, the health of the mother, the mental health of the mother, that uh, you could uh, ease up a little bit on whatever the restriction was. And I, we've seen that fall away. And in fact, in some of the, you know, laws, we've seen the really punitive ones we've seen just in the past year and a half. Those exceptions are not there anymore at all. Yeah, um, we, um, we got a couple of questions. 
uh, this one is from Liz, um, talking about uh, the morning after pill. We got a few different iterations of this question, but um, essentially the question was, does all of this conversation, the decisions by the Supreme Court apply to the morning after pill or other pill induced abortions? Um, Jacqueline, I just wanna keep going up and back between the two of you, if that's okay. Um, where do we stand on, um, well, I kind of know the answer, but um, how can we address Liz's question? Yeah, I think where I would first start is um, just uh, really quick basics on the um, on emergency contraception, um, which is not, in fact, abortion inducing. The opposition to reproductive health care uh, efforts have really uh, been using that line. So as I think to confuse women and not allow them to trust and be in control of their own bodies, um, the uh, emergency contraception is uh, FDA approved birth control. Um, that means in work just like other birth control, but it can be uh, used up to 72 hours of following unprotected intercourse. And so that um, birth control method is a part of the 18 approved FDA types of birth control covered under the Affordable Care Act. Um, and I think uh, one of the things that helped to muddy the waters a little bit about that was that we saw religiously affiliated employers like Hobby Lobby uh, bring their case a few years ago to the Supreme Court specifically about uh, their opposition to emergency contraception, sort of singling out one type of birth control over another type of birth control. Um, and so you know, where we stand today is that um, the vast majority of people are going to continue if they have employer covered uh, uh, insurance that they uh, would have access to emergency contraception. Um, that uh, unfortunately, what yesterday's decision in Trump v. Pennsylvania stands for is the fact that um, you uh, could be subject to a religiously affiliated employer or an employer who has a moral objection to that birth control, and then they could take it out of your health plan so that you are having to pay out of pocket um, for that type of that type of birth control. And let's let's remember like who at the interview ask if you have an employer sponsored healthcare plan that's gonna have a religiously affiliated objection, right? This is not really how we uh, take and choose the jobs that we have. So the idea that any woman is gonna know that her employer has blocked her access to coverage uh, is highly unlikely. And so that's why yesterday's decision is really dangerous. Yeah, no, or feel comfortable asking. Um, Can I add right, one, I, just, yes. one quick thing? Because I think we haven't talked about, um, for all that we've talked about the perils, I think that it's important to say that in a lot of states uh, where folks have figured out that state and local elections make a huge difference and state Supreme Courts that are elected make a huge difference, we have seen Virginia being uh, the most recent example real bolstering of reproductive rights. And so I think like this is as much as it's, you know, it is in truly a perilous time. We have roadmaps for what happens when your lieutenant governor and your governor and your state senators and your state legislatures uh, are educated about this and sort of buy into it. And I just, you know, I say it partly uh, in response to questions about the morning after pill, but also states that have really broadened telemedicine, for instance, and broadened, really made it much easier for women to terminate pregnancies. Just to say, like, it, the, the opposite trend is happening, but it is entirely determinative that people get out and vote for people who care about this at the most granular local level. It reminds me so much of um, voting restrictions. So there's so certain states that are expanding those restrictions and they tend to be the same states that expand access to reproductive care. And there are certain states that are just very quickly pulling back. Um, and I wish we had more time to talk about that. Um, but Dahlia, we have a question from Dave. Was there a Hamilton reference in one of the recent decisions? Uh, and if so, could you review it briefly? Uh, I can't review it, but I can tell you that John Roberts today is all about Aaron Burr. It was the most astounding. I was on another um, uh, another uh, briefing today and somebody said it is clear the entire Roberts family has been doing nothing but watching Hamilton on a loop because the entire majority opinion uh, today was like obsessively focused 
on Aaron Burr. So um, I can't uh, cite it chapter and verse. All I can say is, you know, Elena Kagan's been dropping the Hamilton bomb, uh, you know, Brett Kavanaugh, like there's nobody who isn't. The better question is who isn't citing Hamilton and also like these Supreme Court justices, they're just like you and me. Um, right. Uh, and actually we got a question about, um, they're just like you and me, sometimes they get uh, head injuries. <laughs> Um, and so well, I say this because I'm accident prone. Um, one of the questions was, and then um, Jacqueline, I want to go to you for a couple of other questions, but um, Dahlia is an avid SCOTUS watcher. What do we take of the fact that Chief Justice John Roberts had an apparent tumble and it wasn't disclosed until there was a tip to the Washington Post who then specifically asked about it? I mean, I think that the sort of short descriptive answer is we take the Supreme Court at its word when they say this was not, you know, he does have a seizure disorder. He's had um, problems before. Uh, they say that this was dehydration. And I suspect we have to just take uh, them at uh, their word that it was dehydration. But I think that the larger issue is that the Supreme Court press office is just demonstrably horrible about giving medical information about the justices. And I remember when Chief Justice Rehnquist, I haven't mentioned his name twice in an hour in like 10 years. So it's very weird that he's coming up again. But when he was actually dying of thyroid can cancer and being diagnosed and missing arguments, and it was clear that something was really wrong, the press uh, office was not giving information at all. And I think, you know, we've had the same problem with Justice Ginsburg where they give minimal information after the fact. Uh, there seems to be some funny standard that says like, don't you worry your little heads about the justice's health, we'll tell you uh, either when you need to know or when somebody tips off a reporter. And I think it goes to just this larger, you know, you can definitely have a whole hammer forum about the court and its utter lack of transparency in every single way. But it is another, you know, when, when we say that the court is not top of mind for people, it's another time to remember that we have three justices who are 80, um, and that we, you know, with all due respect to, to people in their 80s, that this is just a material election issue, that this is a, an aging court, and they're not going to tell us what's going on with their health. Yeah, I mean, you're right, that there is a whole other form about proposals to reform the Supreme Court, uh, the opacity of the Supreme Court, the fact that we really only had any transparency with respect to oral arguments when we had a global pandemic, and then, of course, we don't know if that will continue thanks to the uh, toilet fr flush heard around the world. Here's looking at you, Stephen Breyer. Um, and that was Josh's question about the Justice, uh, Chief Justice Roberts injury. Jacqueline, um, I'm just gonna try and get through these, uh, get through the questions because I love that the audience is participating and we wanna make sure to answer all your questions. Um, so Jacqueline, if, you, if I could go to you for this one, um, how do conservative jurists, this is from Joseph, how do conservative jurists respond to the argument that the law doesn't require doctors who perform riskier outpatient procedures like colonoscopies to obtain admitting privileges? Yeah, it's really a good question because I haven't actually answered this uh, in the way that uh, we, as you know, in common understanding, you would you would look to other similar types of medical procedures um, and sort of compare what would be the admitting rates of other types of, of doctors. Um, so much of the uh, going back to uh, the Texas floor debate when they had this argument, so much of uh, the passage of this bill and its legislative history was really about, um, as you heard Dahlia speaking earlier. Earlier, uh, about the protection of women. Um, and the frame was not exactly on the doctors, but the debate was really about um, the need for these restrictions to protect women, um, that that really kind of doesn't come up. Um, and so conservative jurists are able to um, treat abortion differently. And I think we have to always remember that the stigma of abortion um, continues across, with, uh, across healthcare, across um, in the legal field, and we continue to see that um, what conservative jurists are able to say is that abortion should be looked at and treated differently. Um, yes, and I just saw a question um, pop up. Would you provide case citations for the cases mentioned? Um, Ham reform staff, I'm happy to do that um, tonight or early tomorrow morning. Um, 
Jacqueline, I see a lot of questions for you. Um, so let's go, let's go up and back. Let's go to Dahlia briefly from Eric. Uh, if Biden becomes president, but the Republicans hold the Senate, do you think a Supreme Court nominee would get approved? I'm having a little PTSD just asking that question because of um, hashtag Merrick Garland. Uh, but if you could take that one from Eric, that would be wonderful. Um, I mean, I think we know what we know is that uh, during the fall of 2016, we had Ted Cruz and uh, Mitch McConnell, and at the time, John McCain, uh, overtly running on the platform that if Hillary Clinton were to be elected, they would hold that seat, what they called the Scalia seat, open for four more years. That was an open campaign promise. Uh, so I think that there is no reason to believe that that would be different now. In fact, I think uh, they would double down on the proposition that um, whatever they called the Biden rule <laughs> in 2016 uh, will continue to be the rule. And the rule is if you have the Senate, uh, you have that seat. I think it was it was explicitly promised in the 2016 campaign. Sorry about the PTSD, buddy. Yeah, um, I'm really, I want to do 45 more minutes with both of you on this topic, but I also want to get to Deborah's question. And um, Jacqueline, for you, um, Deborah asks, it sounds as if you anticipate upcoming restrictions. Um, and are you planning to get out in front? I know the answer to that, which is yes, you are. Um, how can we, you, on a nationwide basis, um, address the damage of taking away a woman's right to choose and what she wants to do with her body. So that question again is from Deborah. Yeah, thank you, Deborah, for asking the question. Um, a, a couple of things I would say as individuals we could sort of do right now because of what we talked about at the top of this call that uh, your right uh, really depends on where you live and access remains such a huge issue for women. I would say to anyone who is able to, to look up your local abortion fund in your state and just consider donating. Abortion funds are the folks who are helping uh, women with their medical expenses, um, with transportation. If they do, because of draconian and restrictive laws, if you have to make a 500 mile trip, um, because in the state of uh, Louisiana and Texas, there's only, there's very few uh, clinics available. Um, you really do need that support and abortion funds um, and other reproductive justice organizations are the ones doing that. Um, I would say if you're thinking about how to get uh, your elected officials and use your voice uh, to uh, influence this process, uh, two things I would say is that everybody can talk to their senators about these judges um, and making sure that you're using uh, certainly Planned Parenthood, um, but also many other organizations uh, like Alliance for Justice, um, Demand Justice, uh, who are working on the courts to talk uh, with them and learn and sign up on their list and learn more about how you could talk to your senators before these judges get pushed through. The majority of them are uh, getting confirmed within uh, matters of, you know, days. So 20 days or less, we're getting more and more courts uh, filled. Um, and then lastly, I would just name that um, uh, we, after the June medical decision, we saw many members of uh, the House Pro-Choice Caucus, those members that do support um, reproductive health care and rights, uh, really call for the uh, push of the Women's Health Protection Act. Uh, this is uh, legislation that you can ask your members to support and to vote on uh, that would use uh, actually uh, very similar to voting rights. So I do wish we could talk about that, but it actually sort of uh, talks uh, through the idea that um, you would have a Department of Justice that's reviewing uh, these state restrictions before they can become law. Um, and that's one uh, idea that's out there that is a new idea and concept and a way to um, at the push back on these restrictions at the federal level. Yeah, and um, if anybody's wondering how important federal judges are to the Senate, think about the one reason they came back during the pandemic. They came back to confirm federal judges. And um, so I promised uh, the two of you 615, it's 618, but I also promised the audience very quickly that we would talk about um, the cases that came out today. And um, so let me, let me just say today, the last day of the term, we got the big Trump financial documents cases. There were of course two cases, one dealt with a New York state grand jury and a subpoena for President Trump's financial records to not President Trump, but his accountant and his lenders. 
Another dealt with three congressional committees. And again, subpoenas regarding President Trump's financial records. And in that case, again, not to President Trump, uh, but to his accountants and lenders. Uh, what is this case not about? It's again, not about any presidential papers. It's not about any official White House documents. There's no claim of executive privilege. What it is about is private financial information from the president before he became president. Congress said, we need this information for a couple of reasons. Uh, we need this information because we're looking at the adequacy of government ethics laws. We need this information because we're looking at uh, foreign influence in elections. And um, Dahlia, what did the Supreme Court say today? Well, it's a tricky one. It's another Rorschach test and uh, commentators have spent the better part of the day trying to parse uh, at the most fundamental level, seven to two decisions. The, the, the New York uh, Vance case, that was the one that had to do with the grand jury is the simpler of the two uh, because it appears to be seven to two or five to two to two, some version of that saying, of course, grand juries can have access uh, to this material. The president is just a man after all. Um, and uh, essentially saying that the arguments that the president advanced in those cases, uh, saying that it would be tantamount to harassment, it would be too distracting, uh, that he couldn't do his job, were not good enough. There's a footnote where the chief justice writing the opinion says there might be some claim that he could bring that could block these, <clears throat> but for right now, um, and so this case goes back uh, to the district court, but I think at least presumptively the grand jury uh, gets access to those documents at least sometime in the near future. The other case is trickier, Jessica, because again, the chief justice writing says, well, you know, Congress, of course, should have some oversight power, but, and then there's just a lot of gibbering about, um, you know, the separation of powers and seemingly the same John Roberts who did not like a balancing test in June Medical, as I said, loves balancing tests when it comes to congressional subpoenas. So he's got this new four part test that he's laid out, suggesting that if Congress could meet that test, then of course they could perform their oversight function, but it has to go back to the district court to be reviewed under that standard. So I think if the legal question is, are the American people going to see Donald Trump's financial documents before November of 2020? The answer is no. If the question is, was today a lofty and resounding proclamation about the president's uh, claimed immunity from all oversight? Also no. So it was a little bit of something for everyone. I think the history books will look back on this and scratch their heads and say, I don't quite know what the holding of the case was, but shruggy. Shruggy, I'm tempted to leave it at that. Um, I again want to remind the people who are on that we're going to do a special form with uh, former actor, acting Solicitor General Neil Katyal and CNN Supreme Court reporter Ariane DeVogue on July 22nd about the financials. Um, Jacqueline, I'd like to end with you and to basically re-ask you a question because I actually think it may be the most important one, which is um, remind the people who are listening. Um, if we can't donate funds and, um, and we're largely at home, uh, what can we do? Yeah, one of the things that our organizers are finding is that with everyone home, you can still make a phone call. Um, it is possible to make a phone call. You can call your members about conservative uh, judges who are anti-reproductive health care. Um, there will be uh, in the month of August and September, more of those coming up and uh, members can also, uh, members of the house can hear from you about passage of the Women's Health Protection Act. Um, and it's really important that what we're all doing is staying at home, sharing on social media. So as you're sharing on social media, make sure that your friends and your networks know about the importance of these issues. Um, Jacqueline, Thank you so much. Um, I, to all the people who ask questions, I'm gonna ask the hammer to save it. And when I provide you with the case citations, I'm gonna try and do uh, a fairly decent job of answering the questions that I can. Dahlia, thank you so much um, for walking through all of this with you. Could not have done it without both of you. Uh, you were really integral to this discussion. And um, 
I'd, I'd love to keep you more, but it's 624. So um, with that camera form, please uh, play us away. <laughs> 